welcome to the eForum Talk Show. Our guest today is Vivek Bhargav, co-founder of Profit VD. Vivek is a serial entrepreneur, angel investor, speaker, and whatnot. Welcome to the show, Vivek. Thank you. Vivek, uh, you come from a family that is into business of musical instruments, uh, sitar. Uh, but we learned that you decided to set up your own digital marketing company, you know, instead of joining family business. And I think it was uh, in the late 90s when most people uh, had neither heard of internet and uh, uh, neither they know about the digital marketing. So can you quickly share your experience and learnings from your first venture? Sure. So I'll tell you a very interesting story how the whole company started, right? Uh, so Bhargava's uh, music and Bhargava's group basically is into exports of musical instruments. We export to nearly 40 countries. And we have a carrot rule in our family. All the kids are told when they are 13, 14 years of age, that if you come and do bank reconciliation, you come and work in the office, you work in the shop, and we'll take you abroad every two months. So we used to have trade fairs in Paris, in Germany, and other places. So we would get to go and attend those trade fairs. And the opportunity for us was that when you're 14 years old, you're willing to give your right arm to go to Paris. Because you can tell your potential girlfriends that I was in Paris yesterday. But the fact of the matter is, we were bonded laborers there. Because what would happen is, we would make coffee, we'd clean up the stall, we would do everything. And these are the cheapest labor they could find at the cost of an air ticket. But the exposure that I got, especially in the US market, was the way US and American companies are using technology for marketing. It was a big lacuna area in the Indian corporate sector. I think companies in India were hesitant to do marketing itself. Because we come from a very humble culture. And then using technology for marketing was a bigger lacuna idea. So in 1997, I started Communicate2. The goal of Communicate2 was we'll help companies in India leverage technology to make their marketing more effective. With that vision, we started Communicate2. But what you're saying is right. It was hardly, uh, people didn't know internet. So uh, the initial years, we were basically taking companies' brochures, putting a CD-ROM in it, which was made by us. And then we would tell the, hand the brochure back to the company and we would tell the company, now your digital transformation is complete. You have a CD-ROM in your brochure. So that was the first few years. But we did a CD-ROM from Mr. Chandra Babu Naidu. No, sorry. We did a CD-ROM from Ban. So we've had tremendous success. The first two Abbey Awards of Digital were Abbey Goals were won by us. One for MTV and one for uh, Art Site or Sonal Lisa. So the early days were very, very exciting. And I think today I appreciate digital a lot more because of the effort that I put in in those years of trying to understand digital when digital was zero to one. Mm-hmm. So, but I think the learning at that point in time for me was very critical because how do you pivot your models, right? When in digital marketing didn't work, we pivoted to a CD-ROM. Uh, when uh, at that point in time, website creation was one, but we realized that a lot of people need consulting. So we started consulting companies. We were able to build the first MTV website for India. We built the first UTV website. I'd done a website for Muchar Panwala, which became very famous in those days. And we got a lot of traction. So Ban MTV gave us less references and clients, but Muchar Panwala gave us more references and clients. So I think when you're in that stage where there is no market, you're trying to create a market, then innovation becomes very critical. And you're able to think on your feet and create some kind of, you know, they say that, uh, how do you create that purple cow? That because of that, you're able to build Great company. So, Mr. Panwala was our purple cow. You tried it. We have been part of Densio Group for a very long time. And when you started off at Profit Wings, and I guess you wanted to connect ad tech with Martech uh, to make them both efficient. So how successful you have been so far in doing so? Yeah. So, I'll tell you my story with Densu, right? So, I sold to Densu in 2012. Once I sold in 2012, there was this five years earn out where they buy your company over a five year period of time. And digital grew, like we almost grew 15x in those days. So we had a great one out. Then what happened was, I spoke to Ashish, who was the CEO then, that what are the things I should do next? So he said, we can build a performance group. So we acquired a few companies like SVG, Socrates, Merkel, etc. And we were able to build, a, I think the performance group of Densu was 5x the size of most other groups. So we were almost 2,000 people by the time I left. And how I left was very interesting. Uh, Middle of COVID, July 2020, I was writing a book on happiness, which is now getting published in the next few months. Uh, Profit Wheel has taken over all my time because of which the book has been delayed. But the book is complete. And one line, the book is called Happiness is a Muscle. I wrote a line in the night that says, happiness comes in the growth phase. It does not come in the phase of stagnation. 
Next morning, I quit Denso. I said, I'm stagnating in Denso. And uh, I wanted to build a company along with two co-founders, Aman Khanna and Gautam Mehra, where the whole focus was that this company should allow us to build a SaaS platform for, at that point of time, connecting ad tech to Martech. But over a period of time, we realized <laughs> that there is a bigger space for consumer intelligence. So what we've taken to build is a consumer intelligence platform. It is focused on large enterprises. We work with Fortune 100 companies in the US who invest about $25,000 a month with us on the platform. In India also, we work with ICJ Bank, with Viraj Auto and some of our clients who are again paying between ten dollars and $25,000 eventually for the platform. But what we do is we are creating a consumer intelligence platform for large enterprises. So most companies know a lot about their customers based on what the customer transacts with them. But if I ask you, would they like a certain cuisine? They like wine or beer? They like a certain sport or not? They like comedy as a genre? All this information is not there. But the field of advertising ecosystem, Google tells you what people are thinking. Meta tells you what people are doing. Amazon tells you what people are buying. Spotify tells you what people are listening. If you can tap into the official APIs of all these platforms, you can actually know what your customers are thinking, doing, and buying. That can make content creation more effective, creative more effective, media buying more effective, influence selection more effective, market expansion more effective. It also gives a common currency to large organizations. Okay, this is the psychographics of your most profitable customers. How do you align all your teams to work in that same direction? So it's basically getting a North Star for the organization. So the, all the teams work in the same direction. That's very, very powerful for an enterprise. Right now, all the different departments work in silos. They don't know who to go after. So here it's data led and it's very deterministic data because the platforms tell you consumption, tell you intent, they tell you buying behavior. So it's very deterministic data. And I think large organizations can transform themselves when they initiate working with profit view. Uh, Vivek, uh, you talk, uh, you also talk about, you know, uh, making advertising and marketing expense as cost of sales rather than expenses. Can you please explain this proposition? Yeah. See, basically what happens is, right, the biggest challenge with the advertising industry is, right, are, are all the most of the partners work on a percentage of advertising spends. So if a client is spending $100, let's say I'm getting $10. If I make the client spend $1,000, I make 10x, I make $100. The problem is for, for me to make like $90 more, the client has to spend $900 more, right? So the thing is at some level, right, that model is broken. So what we thought was that we will give you a consumer intelligence platform. Whether you spend 100 crores or you spend 1000 crores, our cost to you remains the same. We can give you programmatic from that. We can give you uh, content creations, insights, creative insights. And the goal is right that if we can make your advertising as a cost of sale, the problem with advertising is it comes in the profit and loss account. So it's an expense. If we can shift it to the balance sheet, it becomes a cost of sale. So if I tell somebody, listen, you won't need to spend a billion dollars. As long as I give you $10 billion of revenues, they don't have a problem in spending a billion dollars. So I think the way you look at it from a long-term perspective, a lot of advertising is going to become cost of sale based, especially the creator economy and the influencer economy is helping that process. But I think there is a role to be played across. Advertising has multiple roles, right? So there's awareness, interest, and desire, and there is action. Action has to be cost of sale based, but awareness may not be. So if you really want to help your client and increase the spend 10x, if you can work and eventually help them create advertising as a cost of sale, they will get a lot of benefit. But what we thought in that process was that instead of working on a percentage advertising spend basis, we will work on a SaaS fee basis. So the SaaS fee allows us to be in the same side of the table as the client. If the client saves 50% advertising cost, then they don't pay us 50% lesser. Because otherwise what happens is my incentive to save them money goes away, right? Because my revenue is reduced. So we just charge a flat fee with a tech platform. And that has allowed us to work where we are on the same side of the table as a client. We are not the adversary. But if, if they spend more and that's the only way for me to make money, then at some level, right, there's a conflict. So are Indian brands open to experiment with SaaS tools? I mean, you have a lot to offer, right? Yeah. So actually, Kanchan, I'm, I'm being pleasantly surprised. We now have clients who've been paying us for a year 
We have clients who are paying us ten thousand dollars a month only for pilots. We have clients who very easily will take that ten thousand dollars and making fifty thousand dollars a month as SaaS fees. So I think the way I look at companies is right. I don't think we should divide companies from India and US. The way I look at it is there are about two thousand companies in the world who be willing to invest between fifty thousand dollars to hundred thousand dollars in SaaS. Now. Out of the two thousand companies, one thousand there are probably in US. The rest of one thousand are in the rest of the world. There'll be two hundred companies in India, one hundred companies in India who will invest one hundred thousand dollars a month on SaaS. Now, if you take a Mahindra Group, it's seventy thousand crores, so it's ten billion dollars. Globally, there will be ten other companies who are ten billion dollars. They are all similar to each other. So, I think what Code has done is it has made the world flatter than before. So sitting out of India, my chief, my head of product sits out of Calgary in Canada. My co-founder is based in Boston. We've got people in different parts of the world working for us. So what happens is we are a global company, even though our tech team and a co-founder who's the CEO of the company is based out of Mumbai. The fact of the matter is we are a global company, and I should treat every company based on the revenues they have, rather than look at what geography they're residing in. If you take a Bajaj Auto, they have operations in seventy countries. So the fact of the matter is, sitting out of Pune, be able to operate a company which is in seventy countries. If we license our platform to them, we can help them expand in seventy countries. So then, for them to invest fifty thousand dollars or hundred thousand dollars a month becomes much easier because we're adding the millions of dollars of value. So if you are able to deliver a million dollar value to a company in any part of the world, whether it's India or US, they will pay you hundred thousand dollars a month. If you are able to deliver. That, Uh, are these tools affordable you know for for smbs as well so rajan what our goal is right i think at this point in time what is our cost our cost is the sales pitch that we have to make to them our cost is the consulting we have to give them we do workshops with the senior most companies uh, like c suite or these large companies so the conversation we have with them is very strategic so you know we are playing the role of a mckinsey kind of a consultant who's helping them navigate consumer insights and consumer intelligence to take decisions across every single facet of an organization so at this point in time we can only help large companies who are willing to invest 10000 dollars and above per month on saas fees but you fast forward a few years right i would like to give our platform for 99 dollars a month and give it to millions of people but then at that point in time it should be self serve platform the customer success has to be self serve there should be a credit card mechanism you should see the videos and learn how to use the platform you should figure out how you can use your customer data for all these decision making So large enterprises need somebody who can help and handhold them, and it requires people of my caliber to help handhold them. And I am an expensive guy, right? That's the reason the tool takes more effort and more time, and it's expensive tool. But eventually, SaaS has ninety percent gross margin. So fact of the matter is that eventually, can I give it for ninety nine dollars to a million people? That will be ninety nine dollars, ninety nine million dollars a month. Yes, I would love to do so, but we'll do so after we get the first. 500 clients, so we go to about a 5 million era MRR. Then we will give it to SMEs thereafter. Mm-hmm. So we would like to know uh, about uh, your tools like audience comparison, market finder, and market expander. Hmm. I think yeah. developed by your company, right? Yeah. So Kanchan, what has happened now is right. We've taken all our tools and we put them into one single omni box. So it actually looks like a Google search engine. So. Maybe I can share the screen and just show you how the tool looks. Yes. So this is our platform. It's called Consumer.ai. This is the this is the, exactly the platform that companies get. So whatever you want to do, whether it's market expander, whether it's interest finder, etc., you can do it out here. So like so you're talking about Mahindra Auto, right? I can just put in Mahindra Auto as here. I can take Mahindra. I can put Scopio out here, and within seconds, I can tell you which globally markets. Uh, There is maximum consumption of Scopio outside of India. So you click on this; it will create a global map of the world and tell you which countries in the world are consuming more information on Mahindra Scopio. So, and at this speed, it works, right? So while we are talking, within thirty seconds, it has already created a global map of where consumption of Scopio is happening globally. This is the speed it works. This is all happening live, right? So India is the largest. After that is South Africa. Now, South Africa, we want to sell Mahindra Scopio. I want to know the psychographics of people. To consume information information on Mahindra Scopio in South Africa, I click on something called View Insights. We build this entire taxonomy. We can tell you the age and gender. We can tell you the stages of life they come from, what the interests they have, 
and all this is now being built for South Africa. So these are consumers who are consuming information on Mahindra Scorpio in South Africa. So let's say they are 78% male, 21% female. In Mahindra Scorpio in India is 9% female. That means there are more SUV drivers in South Africa who are female as compared to India. So now that may elicit some kind of product changes that you do for South African market because there are more female drivers in it. And India is mainly uh, male drivers. Now you look at their interest, right? Their interest in outdoors. They're interested in fishing, surfing, camping. So now just imagine, right? You may need an accessory where you can put a surfboard. You need an accessory where you can put a fishing rod. So when you're launching an SUV, a Mahindra Scorpio in South Africa, you need to cover a place for a fishing rod and a surfboard because they have very high interest in fishing and surfing. They're interested in automotive, they're interested obviously in boats uh, because it's surfers. They also need 4 by 4s which is the Mahindra Scorpio. They're interested in sports. In sports, they're interested in car racing and golf. Cricket is there as a niche market, but they're interested in golf and car racing. So now, this imagine, right? This will drive. You started off with just one topic, which is Mahindra Scorpio. You got global consumption of demand of that one car. Then you got psychographics of the audience in each country. Based on this, you can do product planning. You can do marketing. You can do content creation. So let's say if you want to build a community of people in South Africa who will be perfect target audience for Mahindra Scorpio, then you should build a community that focuses on uh, people who are car racing enthusiasts or people who are fishing enthusiasts or people who are surfing enthusiasts. And that community is your best audience in South Africa. Now that community may not be your best audience in India. So imagine, right, instead of doing market research, they spend crores of rupees in their content planning, their creative strategy, their entire uh, media buying, everything, the global expansion, right? Suppose you are in 11 countries. Just with this one search, you can decide these are 11 countries. What is the 12th country I should launch in? So based on the consumption of your brand or your industry, you can decide which country you launch next. Because just imagine launching in the wrong country can be so expensive. You need to choose your brand ambassadors based on this. So if you have a brand ambassador who is a surf, surfing world champion from South Africa, he can be your great brand ambassador for a Scorpio because your audience loves surfing. Right? So the way we look at it, they say it's an intelligence engine. It's like Google. You can do millions of things on it. A click of a button, you should do it. So we've taken all our tools, put it into one single bar. We call it Omnibar. So anybody who knows how to use Google can start using a tool within 10 minutes. Because all you do is go to that search box and search for whatever you want. Imagine for you, right, Kanchan, as a journalist, any topic that you want to research, right? If you have this tool, why would Exchange for Media not give this tool on a per user basis to every single journalist you have? Because suddenly what happens is even the creatives, right? We can actually create blogs based on psychographics of your customers. So our tool integrates into ChatGPT. It is in a cohere, and it is in a BART. Then we have a comparison AI engine. And based on that, we are able to create a, create a brief based on your customer data. So if we have 100,000 customers who bought a Mahindra Scorpio, now I'm going to create a creative brief and a creative unit based on the psychographics of those 100,000 people. So that is the power of AI in a way in the world today. And platforms like us, we believe we can transform companies. We are so excited about working with some of the large organizations because I think we can transform them at every single level of the enterprise. Because once they know these are the most profitable customers they have, everything the organization does across the organization can be aligned in that one direction, that North Star. And that can be pretty transformative for large companies. Maybe the uh, I guess data security and privacy is also a major issue now. With more yeah. and more companies uh, investing in first party data these days, do you, do you see a spike in demand for security tools? Yeah. So... So we are a consumer intelligence platform content, so we may not have uh, a play in the security part of it, but I'll tell you what we've done, right? We believe that uh, there are two things that have happened. One is cookies are getting deprecated, so cookies are going away. And second thing is GDPR and CCP has become very important in the world. So earlier, people were thinking of consumer intelligence on a one-to-one -one basis. So they were not thinking, what does Kanchan like? Does she like wine or beer? Does she like a Korean cuisine? Does she like outdoors? Does she like camping, surfing? The problem is, even with that data, if I have about you, I can't activate it anymore. Because the thing is, no advertising platform allows one-to-one -one targeting. So what we've done is, we have done enrichment at a cohort level. 
So the way we work with clients is large enterprises upload their data into any of the platforms. The platforms take their hash data, delete all the uh, data and just link it to Facebook IDs. And we take that data and work the magic of our platform. So because of that, we are GDPR compliant, we are CCPA compliant, and at no point in time, we are touching first party, even hash data of any of our clients. So that allows us to work with Fortune 100 companies quickly without spending two years of contractual negotiations with them because if you're handling the first party data of a large Fortune 100 company in US, then, then, then it would take us two years to start working with them. We're able to go live with them in two months. Uh, so I think security is going to be critical. A lot of companies who are based uh, on collecting consumer intelligence on cookies are going to face challenges. Companies like us who basically focus on first party data, because what we're doing is right, we're taking a genome of your most profitable customers and then allowing you to see what the genome looks like. And based on that, telling your organization to take every single facet of the organization, targeting that genome. So, and because it's done on a cohort or segment basis, and you're not sharing any first party data with us, it remains extremely secure. And that allows large organizations the comfort to work with a, in a way, a company like ours, which may not be of a similar size, because at least at all points of time, security and safety of their first party data is paramount in our minds. Yeah. Now the last question, uh, we would like to know from you, what are the emerging trends in SaaS? I think the emerging trends in SaaS, I would say AI is the biggest emerging trend in SaaS. Because I think, you know, Ben Evans says that, you know, there are certain things that reset the entire world. I think generative AI is resetting the entire world. So what's happening is that everything that we do is, is improving. So in fact, our platform uses a lot of AI a neural network that we built because we have mapped 1.2 million liters of Facebook to 200,000 categories on YouTube, to 120,000 categories on Tutomatic, to 17,000 on TikTok and 600 on Snap. We built a neural network that takes an interest, you know, market expander you mentioned. Uh, audience that likes cricket in India, likes Formula One in Dubai, likes ice hockey in Canada, likes soccer in UK. So just imagine that mapping done at the global scale cannot be done without AI. And now what we're doing is we're taking all these inputs and putting into a Cohere, Bart, ChatGPT, et cetera, and then using a comparison AI engine to give you the output. So the way I look at it is when you see the video script created by a platform or a search ad created by a platform, it almost makes a creative agency squirm because they think they're going to lose their jobs, right? Because the AI is generating this by superior quality at the speed, which is unbelievable. But really what my thought on this is, right? Uh, yeah. Let's say uh, 50 years ago, or 25, 30 years ago, Tom and Jerry cartoon was made by a thousand people, right? But what happened was that today, two people with a computer can actually create Tom and Jerry cartoon. But you know what? Today, we don't make Tom and Jerry cartoon anymore. We make Shrek. Shrek still requires a thousand people. So if you want to continue doing what you're doing today, and after 10, 20 years, you still want to make Tom and Jerry, you will not remain relevant and you go bankrupt. But if you order to make Shrek, you, if, First of all, 30 years ago, Shrek was just not possible. So you have to now still take a thousand people and build a Shrek. So in the marketing and advertising balance, you have to do a lot more than you've done ever before. If you have 100 million customers, can you divide those 100 million customers into 100,000 thousand cohorts? Can you have customized creative for all those thousand cohorts? Can you have video scripts for all those thousand cohorts? Can you do something phenomenal for all those thousand people, thousand cohorts that are different from each other? That cannot be done without AI. That cannot be done without platforms like ours. But if you still want to do that same one creative for 100 million customers, then you're going to fail as a company because you, you're you not going to be relevant. Somebody else will create those customized creatives for your 100 million customers in a thousand cohorts and they will get much better efficiencies than you can ever imagine. So I think generative AI is the biggest trend in the field of SaaS. And I think it's going to transform every single SaaS company. Because Salesforce is integrating with ChatGPT and AI, search engines are integrating with it. We have Slack, which is now integrating with it. So uh, luckily, we were built from day one uh, with AI integrations. So we do have a competitive edge over companies who are now trying to integrate AI into the SaaS platforms. But as, that's the benefit of starting a little late than other SaaS companies, because then you are able to take the latest things and make it a part of your DNA from scratch. Thank you so much, Vivek, for taking time out and speaking with us when you are in Dubai. Thank you.
my pleasure kanchan your pleasure speaking to you yeah thank you